they're using a smiling image of them. Typical shot they use before they introduce somebody onto a program. And so I'm not really tuned into the commentary going on in the background. I'm just looking at this smiling picture of Scott. And then I look at the lower third of the screen. And that's when I see something that jumped out is peculiar. It says Scott's birth date and then followed by a dash. And then has this date, March 31st, 2004. And before I could really think through what that meant, because it's just so unexpected. I'm trying to process that. And before I could translate what that really means in my mind, it switches from this smiling image of him to graphic video footage. You know, now I'm looking at, you know, video footage of, you know, a vehicle engulfed in flames in the background, which turned out to be the vehicle that Scott was in, along with three other Americans. Welcome to Plain Spoken Grace. My name is Chip Forbes, and today's guest is Chad Williams. Chad's a former Navy SEAL, is currently doing some public speaking, um, and also talking about his book, Seal of God, which we'll discuss a little bit today. So, Chad, thanks for joining us, and welcome. Thank you so much for having me on. I'd like to start off by jumping in with the, with the kind of the big subject, and that is you're a former Navy SEAL, and there are a lot of people who are intrigued by that. So. Talk a little bit about that, your journey, and and uh, maybe some things that people might not even think about or know about when it comes to that. Sure, I, I think that initially a lot of people are pretty surprised to find out that you know Navy SEALs are actually operating on land. You see SEALs in the news all the time, especially when Bin Laden was killed. I think a lot of people are saying, like, what are they doing on land? What is there a puddle in Pakistan? They came crawling out of or something. Right. Uh, but what they don't know is that SEAL is actually an acronym that stands for areas of operation, sea, air, and land. And to kind of give you an idea of what my team was doing on land on the last deployment that I was involved in, uh, we're out in Iraq and given the task of hunting down men that make suicide vests and roadside bombs like those IEDs. And while we're out there, we're working with a group called the ISOF. It's the Iraqi Special Operations Forces. And one of our goals with these guys is to simply teach them how to fight their own fights. And so we figured the best way to do that is to not only train them on base, but actually go outside that wire and fight side by side with them. And if you can imagine, I'd say a whole deployment going by pretty good because we've bagged and gagged some bad dudes. We're making the world a better place. And we were coming up on what looked like just enough time on the calendar to do maybe one more operation. And we weren't certain that the ISOF was ready for us to pass that baton off to them. So we decided, hey, for this final operation, why don't we try and make it a sort of graduation operation? We'll let them plan the whole thing from the ground up and we'll be there with them just in case things go bad. Right. And so they're starting from scratch, hitting the streets. What do they need first? They need some intel. So they find this source that tells them about this man that's an Iraqi policeman by day. But at night, as it turns out, back home, he's one of these bomb makers that we're looking for. And so they come up with this whole plan, how they want to approach the house, get in, grab this guy, extract. And it's all based off of what you know we've taught them. It checks out, looks pretty good. So we're loading up the vehicles. I've got my night vision goggles on. I'm looking through my green little world. I've got the 50 caliber machine gun in front of me. And that's a weapon that could really reach out and touch somebody. And I'm just kind of going over this mental inventory, thinking about how I know about everything going on about this night. But one unique thing I know about this operation that makes it different than every other operation, I knew this was the final operation, which also meant I couldn't help but to think about it. I knew just a matter of days from now, I'll be back in my hometown, Huntington Beach, California, surfing in the ocean. Right. Uh, but what none of us really knew about that night was that we were actually being set up the entire time to get thrown into the absolute worst circumstances we've been in on this entire deployment as we're being set up on an ambush and getting in this gun battle for our lives. And it truly was the team's ability to do, you know, what we do best as SEALs, shoot, move, communicate, that ultimately led to the possibility of me, you know, sitting before you right now. Right. Uh, but, you know, before maybe we get into the details of how that all ended up, you know, playing out, we can touch on some of the other things you have on your mind. Absolutely. Well, there are a couple of them I want to touch on. So you're a West Coast guy. I'm an East Coast guy. I grew up in Virginia Beach. So my interaction with the ocean is the Atlantic. Your interaction with the ocean is the Pacific. There's some similarities, but then there are also differences. So let's just have a little fun with that. And let's talk a little bit about some of the things that you do recreationally out there on the West Coast. Um, 
Uh, we, you know, both of both areas is surfing. Surfing's better out there in Huntington Beach than it is in Virginia <laughs> Beach. They, they try to actually change the name of our city. This has happened multiple occasions. Yeah. They want to change Huntington Beach to Surf City. Right. There have been debates within the the city council. It's come close, from what I understand. Yeah. Um. But yeah, we have some incredible waves out there, and the weather's for the most part good year round. Uh, just down the ways a little bit in Newport, we have a very famous spot called the Wedge. Uh, which is, you know, if you have like a 10 foot swell at the wedge, they call it the wedge because the waves actually wedge together. It might be 10 foot everywhere else, but you can have 20, 25 foot waves right. there. And uh, when there's a big swell at the wedge, it's all eyes on the wedge. It's it's world renowned. Yeah. Uh, but I grew up, yeah, body surfing and surfing and, and doing kayaking out in the ocean. And, you know, one of my favorite things to still do is, is spear fishing, right. just going out there on a breath hold, going underwater. And waiting for the fish to cruise by that and, and lobster hunting at night absolutely and we kind of talked about that a little bit we you did. know last night getting attacked by a sea lion yeah tell, wow. yeah, it's kind of like tell us it's a fun story yeah so the way that that lobster hunting it's works, a fun story to hear not uh-huh. to live through yeah go ahead <laughs> so you go out at night they're nocturnal you right. can't really catch lobster in the day it's it's kind of possible but they're they're going to come out at night so you're going out your night starts maybe at, at midnight swimming out there into the dark Pacific Ocean and it's just pitch black and you got this light. And so when you go dive down on a breath hold, you know, 10, 15, 20, 25 feet, depending on you know where you're at, uh, you're shining your light around and you're looking for these, these lobster and usually their eyes are, are glowing. So they get caught like a deer in headlights. You go swimming down on them and reach behind them, grab them and stick them in your bag. Well, it's in the back of your mind, the possibility of getting attacked by a shark. You know, I don't care who you are. I don't care. How brave you well, are. It's in the back no matter of your what mind. ocean you're in. Go, yeah. But anyway, yeah. And we have great whites in the area. Sure. I mean, it was all over the news for a while that there was these 10 or 12 great white sharks that have been tagged. There was a, a woman that was recently attacked in Corona del Mar, which is literally just like a half mile away right. from where I was diving this particular night. So it's in the back of your mind. And I'm diving down, going after this big lobster. I'm excited. See him. And as I'm about to reach and grab for him, something grabs me in my arm, the arm that has the light. And I mean, it hurts, it's bone crunching. And now it's it's shaking me underwater. And I'm just going in my mind, I'm flashing, kind of like how life can flash before your eyes and you can think of so many moments. I'm going back in my mind, thinking of watching Discovery Channel uh, where it's shark week and people are talking about what it's like to get attacked by a shark. And I'm yeah. kind of curious, like how bad does it hurt? It's gotta be awful. And what was surprising was a lot of them would say, you know, well, like when I was being attacked, I just felt like I got hit and I felt this pressure. They're not talking about how, you know, horrifically painful it was. And so that's kind of what I'm feeling. I got hit. I feel the pressure and I'm getting shook. I'm thinking shark. And this is probably all happening within like three seconds. Right, right. And I'm switching the light over into my free hand and I'm trying to punch this thing in the face with the light, you know, hit the shark in the nose, right? And as I'm punching on it, I see with the light, this giant eye, and I realize it's a sea lion. And so thank the Lord, right? Yeah. It's a sea lion, but it is like this 300 pound sea lion and I'm at his mercy. He's still shaking me and holding me underwater. Eventually he let go and I go bolting, you know, for the surface. And uh, the worst I had was just a really good deep bruise on my arm. And I I was wearing like a five millimeter wetsuit. So he didn't even get through that. But uh, yeah, I always think of that as that was a seal on seal crime right right there that took place uh, in the water. But definitely one of the hobbies of mine is still getting out there in the water. Well, the reason I wanted to bring that up and you talk about this in your book and, and I want let's get in a little bit. Let's talk a little bit about some of the training and so forth that you did uh, as to become a seal. But one of the benefits that you had is that you had a certain comfort with being in the water. You grew up around it. So you're, you're a little bit ahead of the game when it comes to the water aspect of what you did in training and so forth. So, yeah, I'll elaborate a little bit on that. Just to be comfortable in the water is so important. I remember the first time as a class going to BUDS, basic underwater demolition seal training, we get told by the instructors to go hit the surf. Well, Any other time after that, you know, you're not really looking forward to hitting that water. But because this is the first time, this is the first time as a SEAL trainee, you're getting told by a SEAL instructor, go hit the surf. This is a huge rite of passage. 
Yeah. Like this is really exciting right now. Right. And so I remember running down to that water and I'm looking over at the guy next to me and I don't know who he is. I'm basically just learning who these other 172 guys are in my class, but I'm telling him as we're running, I am so excited right now. And he goes, me too, man. I've never been in the ocean before. <laughs> and I remember just like, what? Yeah. You're showing up to be a Navy SEAL, go through SEAL training, and you have never been in the ocean before? And just like a week later, uh, that poor guy, we're about to do night surf passage, which we're going to go out into the ocean in the night, past the surf zone, flip the boats over, come back in, huge swell. It was what we call like double overhead. So the waves are easily like 12, 15 foot and you could just hear them. It's like thunder, you know, they're breaking out there, but you can't see them. Right. All you see is maybe the whitewash that shows right. up afterwards as a huge wall. And I'm thrilled because I can't wait to get out in that double overhead, you know, surf while this guy that had never been in the ocean before, you know, this is terrifying to him. And he quit right there on the spot before he was even going into the water. And I thought, like, what a total juxtapose right there. Like, this is something that I'm actually really excited about and looking forward to. And I just can't comprehend why this is the thing. Not all the other things we did. This is the thing that psychologically breaks this guy. Right. Uh, before we go out in there in the water. So you yeah, have definitely huge advantage growing up on the West Coast and going through SEAL training on the West Coast. Absolutely. Well. Absolutely. All right. So let's let's dial it back a little bit. Let's talk about and, the, and you again, you allude to this in your book. And, and I and I want to encourage people that don't have a copy to get a copy of the book. It's it's a it's a fun read. It's entertaining. If you want to know a little bit more about what SEALs go through and the training and so forth. And then there are a couple other aspects that we'll get to, you know, as we continue our conversation. You know, some of the things that happened while you were there, some of the things that changed your life. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and, and I also want to talk a little bit about your parents, because as a, as a father, there were some moments in there that were a little bit striking to me. So let's, 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 let's go back. I mean, you, so you're growing up in, in, in you know, Southern California, you're a beach guy, you're hanging out with your buds, you probably have, you know, feeling like you're on top of the world. But there were some things that led to you deciding that you want to become a Navy SEAL. Yeah, well, I was having a lot of fun as a young man, and I was really into skateboarding as well. And I had tasted some success, I think, with that. I was sponsored by Van Shoes. I was competitive. And uh, after a while, though, I kind of got burned out on it. It just it didn't really do it for me anymore. And what I didn't realize was, you know, skateboarding was my identity when I was younger. It was kind of what, you know, made me who I was amongst my friends. Right. And once I wasn't competitively skateboarding anymore, once I wasn't the guy sponsored by Van Shoes that could get the the hookup on you know some of the releases before they're out, I, I noticed that some of those friends began to kind of go away. And so they weren't really friends. Not really friends. Yeah. And 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 that's not unusual, I don't think, no. in in the world. But what I realized was like, okay, like that was my identity before. What's my identity now? All I am is just going to the local community college and I'm failing most of my classes. It's my own fault. So it's just, I'm not trying, I'm not showing up, I'm ditching. There's no accountability. I'm just going surfing. But most of my peers are, are passing me by. And I remember pulling into that school parking lot as it's the end of the year and time to take finals that I didn't study for. So I realized this is just, I'm failing all my classes this year. That's it. And it hits me. Like I'm, I'm becoming somebody I never wanted to be. I'm becoming a loser. I mean, the kind of guy that no young person wants to be. And when you're young, you get told, you know, hey, you could do anything you want to do, you know, with your life. You could be the president of the United States, you know, like whatever right. you want to become. And that is all true. You know, you, that big word potential gets thrown around. But there does come a certain point where you begin to wonder or question, hey, what trajectory are you on? And so me realizing that I am, I'm throwing my life away and I don't want to live a wasted life. In a sense, realizing that was a very good position for me because sometimes I, I feel like I operate better when my back is up against the wall that hold the greater the need, the greater the result. So now realizing I'm in this desperate situation that I desperately want out of, now I'm starting to think and I'm brainstorming. I'm trying to capture that, that vision because that really is the first step before you go and try and accomplish anything, before you ever pull the trigger on anything, you better know exactly what it is that's in your crosshairs you're pulling the trigger on. You know, I think a lot of people start off saying like, hey, I want to do something great, something big. Well, you know, that's too general. You know, in the SEAL teams, we have a saying when it comes to shooting, a fundamental of shooting is aim small, miss small. 
And that's true in hunting, I'm sure, yeah. as well, right? Right, right? You're not just trying to hit that buck. If you can, try and pick out like a hair on the buck that you want to hit. And so you're aiming small. And the idea is if you miss, you know, the miss will be small as well. If I'm just aiming an enemy insurgent that's bearing down on our team trying to flank us and I miss, what happens? I'm off target. I miss. But if I say I'm going for the third button down, I'm aiming at the third button down on his shirt. Well, I'm aiming small. Maybe I miss, but the miss will be small as well. I'm not going to be completely off target. I'm still going to touch him somewhere. Right. And so the same concept is true, I think, when it comes to, you know, setting up an accomplishment or a goal, the more specific you can be about whatever that thing is, the better shot you have of hitting it. So I start with this general idea in my head. I want to do something great, something significant. And one of the first ideas that pops into my mind then was, I know what I'm going to go do. I'm going to go become an Alaskan crab fisherman. Yeah. I'm watching Deadliest Catch. I'm thinking that's by far one of the most dangerous jobs in the world. And I really felt like that would give my life some significance and identity. And then I started to kind of zero in a little bit more like, wait, no, why can't I go join the military? And not just that, I, I want to be a part of the most elite. I'm picking out the branch. I want to be a part of the, the Navy. I want to be a Navy SEAL. And so sitting there in a local community college parking lot about to go take finals that I didn't study for, I just make up my mind. That's what I'm going to do with my life. Like, that's it. I'm going to be a Navy SEAL. And so then I thought to myself, well, if I'm going to be a frogman, my first order of business is this. I guess I don't need to go to class anymore. I started my truck up and I took off out of that school parking yeah. lot. But that really was the mentality of how all in I was on this. And I really felt like now everything was going to become a lot easier. Yeah, the funny and, thing is. And, like, and that news didn't go over very well initially with your parents. No, I had to break the news, the bad news, as I put it, and the good news yeah. to my dad. He had yeah. no idea what was going on with that school year. Yep. So I let him know I'm not passing any of these classes, but I told him there was some good news. And so he wants to know, well, the good news, and I'm prepared to present it to him. It's all right, dad, I got a plan. I'm going to be a Navy SEAL. Yeah. <laughs> and so looking back now as a father, I can, I can sympathize with uh, his response of like, you got to be kidding me. Right. And not just his, but your mother's as well. I think everyone around yeah. me, yeah. even my friends that I would right. you know, share it with, like, hey, I'm going to go become a SEAL. Like, they would say, you know, Chad, you've done some pretty awesome things and I believe in you, but you might be biting off more than you can chew on that yeah. one. That was fuel to me. Well, I got and I got to tell you, I I would I would really like to meet your dad at some point because there was such wisdom in what he decided to do. Mm -hmm. Because he says, "All right, you you think you want to be a Navy SEAL? Here's my son, big talker. He's got some other you know adventure he's going to go on. He's over the side of the boat before he's thinking about what he's doing. Uh -huh. um, and so he hooks you up with somebody who's going to find out if you've got." what it takes. Right. And he was very clever about the way he went about that. I didn't know that this was even a, a test fire. Correct. You know, this first time around, uh, the conversation in the, his room, when I broke that news from that, I want to be a seal first, he's trying to be the voice of reason. He's kind of breaking down how things have gone so far, right? Like joining the military is not like anything you've ever done in the past, son. Right. It's not like playing ball, skateboarding, going to the local community college that when you decide to roll for it, you could just stop. He says, if you join, and then maybe you find out it's not for you, or suppose you quit and don't make it through SEAL training, he wanted to make it pretty clear, like you will still be in the military. There's no getting out. Nice. And you'll probably pick up a job like chip and paint off some boat off in Japan. Right. And so that was a great motivational speech for me right there. I don't know if he meant it that way, but I became determined I will not be that person chip and paint. And then as days went by, I think he could pick up on how serious I was because he invites me inside and he's asking me, so you really want to do this? I go, yeah, dad, I want to, I want to be a SEAL. And he, so he goes, great. Well, I set up a workout for you with a Navy SEAL. Check out my computer screen. I'm in his room looking over the computer. And my first initial thought was my, my dad doesn't have any Navy SEAL friends. So what is this he got into on the internet? And so I'm looking at this email and it's just a little one-liner. It just says, can Chad come out and play tomorrow? And I'm thinking, play? I'm like, dad, you met some guy off the internet that says he wants to play with me and you're arranging this meeting right now? Right, right. He goes, no, he's really a SEAL, son. I'm questioning it. You know, yeah. you don't know who you're talking to on the web. Anyone could be lying. And so he's insisting, this guy's really a SEAL. And I'm like, okay, I'll go meet up with this guy. Uh, what I had no idea about was that 
there was a phone conversation that took place prior to that email. Mm -hmm. I find out about this months later, but the backstory just up front on the phone, he's on the phone with this guy and, and he says, hey, look, my son wants to be a Navy SEAL, but here's the thing. He has no idea what he's signing up for. He doesn't know what he's getting involved in. And so I'm wondering if you would be willing just to do me a solid, a big favor. Would you be willing to meet up with my son? And what I'm asking you to do, what I need you to do, man, I need you to crush him. Like if you can't beat this desire of becoming a SEAL out of him. Right. And so he didn't get the response on the phone. The guy wanted to think about it a little bit. And then the reply came through that email. Can Chad come out and play tomorrow? So off I go. I'm meeting up with this, as far as I'm concerned, Navy SEAL mm -hmm. in a beach parking lot in Oceanside. And he spots me right away, finger pointed at me. You, Chad? Um, like, don't know how to respond. It's military guy. Oh, yes, sir. He <laughs> goes, yeah, right, right. all right, Bubba, come on over here. So yeah. I'm Bubba now from that point forward. And uh, long story short, after doing some calisthenics that I got through, I was, I, was, I was hanging in there pretty good. He sends me off on a run out into the wetlands. He's supposed to catch up in 15 minutes. So I'm looking at the watch 15 minutes into the run. I'm looking over my shoulder, and I'm not seeing this, this Navy SEAL. And so as I'm running a little bit more, looking over my shoulder again, I start getting this idea in my head. Like, hey, maybe, just maybe, I'm too fast for this Navy SEAL. He there can't catch go. up on the run. Right, right. I'm celebrating in my mind, looking over the shoulder again. And it is like a scene cut right out of Terminator 2, the Arnold Schwarzenegger movie, yeah, yeah. where that bad guy, that machine, they call him the T-1000, can suddenly morph into like knife hands and chase down a moving vehicle. Yeah. I'm looking over my shoulder and this Navy SEAL is like that machine, the T-1000 and knife hands coming down this trail for me. And there was nothing I could do to keep that distance as he's closing the gap, catches up to where I am. And I'm thinking we're just running here. This is a race. Never saw what was coming next. As he gets just ahead of me and just plants down, turns on dime. And I'm greeted by his fist, just impaling my stomach as he's punching me and I'm going for a ride, feet coming off the ground, that feeling of the wind knocked out of me before my back even touched that ground. Right. Poof and dirt up all around me. And you gotta put yourself in my shoes here. At the moment, the only intel I had was some guy, my dad met off the internet, now he's got me on the ground in the wetlands, in the middle of nowhere, no one around, and he's jumping on top of me. And I'm thinking, child predator, like this is yeah. happening, no. Yeah. And so this guy's ragdolling me and I'm just doing everything I can to cover up as he's throwing me around. I still remember that sound of just the threads of my shirt just ripping and spit hitting me in the face, the cheek, the forehead as he's screaming. And I don't even understand the words that are coming through. This guy's just going nuts. But then these words did come through. He says, you want to be a Navy SEAL? You better stay three paces behind me. And there was something about those words, that moment right there. Or it was like, for a moment, time stopped, the pain went away, and I had this clarity of thought. What I knew was this, if I quit right now, I'll forever be a quitter. Correct. There's just something about this moment that this is going to affect the way I respond. This is going to affect the, the trajectory of the rest of my life. And so he jumps up and he says it one more time, three paces. And I just had the wind knocked out of me, not exaggerating, after running as fast as I could. Yep. And so I need air and this wind is knocked out. I'm making all the weird growly groaning noises and he just turns and goes. And I, I'm just thinking, die before you quit. I'd rather, I'd rather just pass out from a heart attack at you know, 18, 19 years old uh, than, than quit on this guy. And so I'm going after him. And this goes on for a handful of miles down this, this trail through the wetlands. And he's trying to shake me. He's trying to get rid of me. And I'm doing everything I can to stay on this guy's heels and I hang in there and we finally get to this point where he circles up he's kind of pacing back and forth he's looking at me like he wants to fight and I'm like this teenage skater punk kid I'm thinking like I don't want to fight a navy seal yeah. and so I'm thinking all right at this, this point of... you realize he is a navy seal this is this real. is not just some guy your dad found on the internet he's legit right it right. was in that same moment when he said you want to be a navy seal you better stay three paces behind me that just everything coalesced. It came together right. in my head. Right. And so I'm having this self-dialogue like, all right, Chad, you don't want to set this guy off. No direct eye contact. I'm trying not to look at him. I'm thinking just use your peripherals. Don't look him in the eyes. And he opens up his, his mouth and just says, you know, hey, 
if we would have gone another mile or two, would you have stayed with me? And I just told him right from the heart. I said, Scott, I'll die before I quit. Well, he gets this big smile on his face, completely 180, changes his demeanor. And he goes, great. You want to meet up again in front of the workout tomorrow? And I'm kind of thinking, are we going to address the flashback that guy had on the trail? Because yeah. he attacked me. Like I was assaulted back there. Right. And like it, like it never happened, right? right? But of course, I'm not going to say anything. And so I just, sure, I agree. Yeah, I'll meet up again for the workout. And so I'm going back home. And I'm like thinking, what was that all about? But if that's what it takes, if that's what a SEAL workout is, like a beat down like that, I guess that's what I'm willing to do. I want this. I'll do it every day. I'll do it tomorrow. I'll do it the next day after that and the next day after that. So I go from kind of dragging my feet, feeling a little humiliated there uh, to I'm clicking my heels. I'm excited and I'm, I'm getting home. And my dad, of course, wants to know how that little arrangement went, which I didn't know was a setup the whole time. Yep. I found out months later, like all of us sitting together, they told me that was the plan all along. <laughs> Uh, but I'm reaching for that front door and he's already opening it. And he goes, how did it go? And I got this big smile on my face. Dad, I'm going to do it. I'm going to be a SEAL. And I remember just the look on his face of just shock. Right. And I guess Scott got on the phone, Scott Helvenstein, with my dad afterwards. And he says, look, I know what you want me to do. I gave it a go. I think your son might have what it takes to make it. I'd like to start working with them. Right. And so from that day forward, I began to meet up with this extraordinary Navy SEAL, Scott Helvenston, virtually right. every day. So um, it, in that journey, you go from uh, being called Bubba to Junior. Mm -hmm. You have developed this incredible relationship with Scott, uh, who was a real mentor and meant an awful lot to you. And, then, and, and there's a story there, too. And I know some of this is in the book, but I want you to touch on it a little bit because I think it's important. And then take some of that and then, and then kind of roll that into, you know, when you went in as a SEAL and tell a couple of stories about, about that. And I think that if people want to know more, they ought to buy your book. And okay. buy two. Give one to a friend. Sure. <laughs> hey, anyway, go ahead. That next time I met up with Scott, thankfully, it was no longer a beatdown session like the first time around. It was more of a, a building up. Yeah. And the more and more that we got together... Uh, he became more and more like a mentor, a second father to me. And I, I moved on in life from being Bubba. It was always Bubba, Bubba, Bubba. Uh, all of a sudden, one day, he starts calling me Junior. You know, So he really he took me under his wing. And Scott's an extraordinary Navy SEAL, like I alluded to, because this guy has all kinds of, of world records. Uh, one of them, he's the youngest man to ever make it through SEAL training. He completed SEAL training by the time he was 17 years old. It's completely unheard of. People are probably wondering, how is that even possible? I think the only way that that was possible was the upbringing that, that Scott had. He grew up in over a dozen different foster homes, constantly getting passed around. And I, I guess the, the military kind of opened up their, their doors to him at a very young age. I think it was like 15 years old. Wow. Uh, he was getting signed up and going through. Completed SEAL training by the time he was 17. So he's the youngest man to ever make it through SEAL training. I'm pretty confident nobody will ever beat that, that record. Hopefully, no one ever has to go through the life experiences that would lead up to the possibility of beating that record. Uh, he's also a world champion pentathlete, and so most people are familiar with you know the triathlon three events. You see it on TV all the time. Imagine five events. That's what the pentathlon is. He's a world champion pentathlete. He's also the fastest Navy SEAL on the SEAL training obstacle course. So right. to kind of try and put that in perspective, you know, people think pretty high things of, of Navy SEALs and their athletic, you know, prowess or ability. Think of all the Navy SEALs that ever were or are. Uh, all of us go through this obstacle course. It's in Coronado, San Diego, and Scott holds the record. So not only is he a, a Navy SEAL, he's the fastest Navy SEAL on the SEAL training obstacle course. That says something kind of extra special. And then a, a funny one, I can go on, but uh, another funny one, a record that he has is he was the only man to beat the beast on this television program yeah. at the time called Man vs. Beast, yeah. uh, where it was this reality show where they would take athletes and put them up against wild animals, these beasts in a competition of strength or speed. And, you know, kind of the premise of the show is that, you know, the, the beast, the animal kingdom, you know, wins. Right. Uh, well, they hear about Scott and his incredible ability to run an obstacle course. So they decide, you know, let's get that Navy SEAL on the program. Forget just getting some athlete. Let's get a SEAL on the program, get yeah. the beast one of them. That'd be a good little notch on the belt. 
And so he gets called up and they say, hey, you know, we we know that, you know, you're something special. So we want to know, would you be willing to go up against the beast on, on man versus beast? And Scott never being the kind of guy to back down. They want him to go through an obstacle course against a monkey. He goes, yeah, I'll race the monkey. And so he shows up and uh, this is all out there. Folks can check it out. Navy Silver Chimpanzee. Uh, but I think the obvious thing is that he wins. Not only does he win, where does he pull ahead of this monkey? He pulls out of the monkey on, on monkey bars. Yeah. And so that's Scott, you know, yeah. in a nutshell. Sure. World champion, penathlete, youngest sure. man to make it through SEAL training, fastest Navy SEAL in the SEAL training obstacle course, the only man to beat the beast on man versus beast at the program. And this guy's preparing me. Right. You know, this, right. this guy is the guy that's like a second father to me. And he got me ready. Right. And so uh, it finally came time to get that ball rolling, as he put it, and, and go and, and sign up. And so I did. Signed up. And I had a date. It was set to be shipping off for boot camp. So let's talk a little bit about that. You show up. You're around a group of guys that are all kind of in this to become SEALs together. It's not necessarily a competition, but I know you're trying to size yourself up. How do I, you know, how, how am I going to do? How do I rate? Where do I fit? And then you jump in. So what were the what were the, some of the tougher parts of the SEAL training that you dealt with? And we've talked a little bit about it. You had a little bit of a leg up, probably significant leg up when it came to the water uh, activities. But I had a leg up with water activity, but I definitely was in the negative in terms of body weight. And that's very important right. when it comes to cold water exposure. And so that was one of Scott's concerns. I was probably about 140, 145 pounds when I got together with Scott. And he goes, you know, Junior, we got to do everything we can to get your weight up. Because when you go through surf torture, which is kind of like it sounds, it's like torture in the surf zone, cold water exposure, you know, in the Pacific, going through in February, coldest month out of the year, that water's so cold, it just, as soon as it hits you, <gasps> digs your breath away. And uh, we call it jackhammering cold because you look like you're, you're hanging on to a jackhammer. And so I was a lightweight going in, did everything I could to try and get my, my body weight up, force feeding myself constantly. And I, I did get up to about 165 pounds after about a year of, of preparing. But as soon as I went to Navy boot camp and got on a regular eating schedule and wasn't able to force feed myself the same way, it's like my, my body just went right back down to 145. So I was going into training as one of these real, you know, lightweight guys, they, they called us the Smurf crew, well, right? There's another nickname, right? So <laughs> the Smurfs, yeah, you right? You go from Bubba to Junior to Smurf, yeah. anyway. Go ahead. Everything's yeah. done by Heightline, you know. Right. You don't, yeah. you don't want a six and a half foot tall guy underneath the boat, you know, with a guy that's five foot six, because the six foot guy is going to be carrying all the weight. Yeah. yeah. And so they do everything by Heightline, and you're going to be broken off in, in chunks of, you know, six to seven guys with your your height. And I ended up in, you know, the lowest height line. Uh, which was the Smurf crew. So all the other numbers are, all the, all, all the other boats are numbered, you know, boat crew one, two, three, four. But you get down after one, I think it's Smurf crew. And we don't yeah. even have a Roman numeral on the boat. It's literally a painted picture of a Smurf. Right. But we take pride in yeah, being there you go, right? the Smurf right. crew. Why not? You might as well embrace it. Yeah. It ain't going to change. But one of the, one of the things I, I learned, especially showing up that first day, looking back, uh, was part of the SEAL creed, the, the truth of it. You know, a lot of people wonder, what does it take to become a Navy SEAL? And they have all these ideas in their head of just, uh, just you know, physical athletic ability. And you hear it get tossed around sometimes that, you know, and how could you really quantify it? But they say, you know, SEAL training is 85% mental and 15% physical. And it's like, what? Well, there is some truth to that. And, and so our SEAL creed, part of it goes like this. Of the Navy SEAL, it says he's the, the common man with uncommon desire to succeed. Mm -hmm. And so common man with uncommon desire. So the first day of training, showing up, sizing all the other guys up. I remember the instructors coming into a classroom that we're in and they have our attention. You know, as soon as they enter the room, they command our attention and we're all quiet and eyes locked on. And he says, gentlemen, how many of you are willing to die before you quit? And so we're all pounding our chest and we give them a hoo ya. That's like, that's our yes. And he goes, great. He goes, this is what I want you to do. Why don't you take a mental picture of the person on your left and on your right? So I'm kind of looking around the room, taking weird mental pictures. And he goes, in fact, if you got someone in front of you and behind you, do the same thing, which I did. So I'm looking around these guys. And he goes, chances are, 
If you're still standing here for graduation day, that means each of these guys you just took a mental picture of, they didn't make it. Right. Do you really think you're the one in that group? And I remember looking around the room and thinking, like, wow, like, where are these guys that are going to quit? Where are they going to come from? Because I know it's not me, but at the same time, I can't say that it's them because we've already gone through some pre-seal training together. They call it in-doc, and we've been beat down by the instructors. We've suffered together, and we've gone through some pain, and I don't see quitting any of these guys. So now I'm thinking just, like, how far down the rabbit hole do we got to go before guys start falling off. Like we're going to have to go through some, some suffering that I know not of yet. Right, right. And so realizing that the majority of the room has got to go, I got to at least find some low hanging fruit. What, what are some guys that I think are going to quit? So I'm looking around the room and one of the guys that gets my attention was this guy, Barth. And Barth was not one of the guys that was going to quit. Barth was the sort of the class. Yeah. That's, that's one of the guys I'm looking at that's definitely going to make it because Whenever we're in any kind of competition, right, whether, whether it be running, swimming, the calisthenics, pulps, push-ups, dips, Barth was always like number one. There was never a question over who's going to get first place. We all know who's going to get first place. He was in such a league of his own, right, that like there's Barth out there and then there's the front pack that's competing over. Really, the question is who's getting second, right? And so there's one of the guys that's definitely going to make it. And then I'm like, what am I doing? I'm not supposed to be finding people in my mind that are going to make it. I'm trying to find guys that will quit. And so I'm looking around the room a little bit more, struggling. And then how could I forget about this guy over here, Alex Gagne? Like Alex Gagne is the exact antithesis of Barth. He's the ugly duckling of the class. He's always the guy in the very back. He's the locker room talk. Not only is he going to quit, he's going to be the first guy to quit right. out of anybody. So I'm thinking, all right. Well, at least I kind of got that settled in my mind. There's one of the guys that's going to go. And the irony of it all and the truth of this, this part of the creed that says common man with uncommon desire to succeed, by the time we get to the most difficult portion of SEAL training, uh, which we can maybe get into detail about a little bit later, but it's Hell Week. This is where the majority of the class is going to go. Uh, who was amongst the first to quit during Hell Week? Well, it wasn't this guy, Alex Gagne, who was still around. Uh, amongst the first to quit was this guy Barth, the start of the class, the guy that everybody thought, he, if anyone, he's going to make it. Right. And ultimately, who's one of the guys that made it all the way through to graduation day, the ugly duckling of the class, this guy, Alex Gagne. And so what that demonstrates is the truth of this whole concept of it takes a common man, but with uncommon desire to succeed, the key there being the desire, the heart. How bad do you want it? And so is SEAL training 85% mental and 15% physical? Well, in a sense, I would say 100% of the time it's physical because the way they get you to quit mentally is through like physical pain and torture and suffering. So don't get it mixed up and think that, you know, only 15% of the time you're applying yourself, you know, physically. Um, it's all the time. But really the big part of it is that that mindset, you know, am I really willing to die before I quit? It's the why. Anytime a guy tells me that he wants to be a Navy SEAL, he knows what, but does he have a good why? How bad do you want it? Yeah. And if that why is good enough, it, it's, it's good enough to carry you through to the point where you're willing to die before you ever quit. Well, I want to come back to that thought about common and uncommon. It's a, it's a great, it's a great analogy. I want to come back to that. Shoals Coffee Co. Coffee Roasters is passionate about two things, people and coffee, because we want to ensure that both reach their full potential. We do our part to improve lives by purchasing coffee beans from women-owned farms in Guatemala and Colombia, along with other sources to bring you the fresh taste and quality product you deserve, while also ensuring that workers are paid fairly and treated well throughout the growing process. 100% of the profit from the sale of Shoals Coffee Co. products is poured directly back into bettering the lives of mothers and babies in communities across the U.S., as well as in the lives of women and children in the countries where we purchase our beans. 
Our products are available for purchase online at shoalscoffeeco.com and will be delivered right to your door. So buy Shoals Coffee Co. and enjoy your coffee even more, knowing that your purchase is providing for the needs of women and children today, while also impacting lives for generations to come. Shoals Coffee Co. is owned and operated by Shoals Save a Life Incorporated, a pregnancy resource center in North Alabama, and we are proud to be a sponsor of Plain Spoken Grace podcast. Okay, so here's the, and this happens a lot of times in in in, in men's lives, um, especially. You've got this trajectory of your career, and you're hanging a little a lot of your success and your happiness and so forth on the trajectory of your career or the decisions that you make or the sports that you're playing. And in the midst of that, you've got your you've got your inside, you've got your you've got your heart, you've got your spirit, you've got your own personal dispositions, your your emotions, your worries. Um, there was an awful lot of that at play while you're going through this in your own personal life. Mm-hmm. So talk a little bit about what was going on in Chad's in Chad's life with, you know, the, some maybe some of the things that you were doing, what you thought were the things that you needed to be successful or to make you happy. There's right. an obsession about being happy these sure. days. Let's talk a little bit about that because I know there's a lot of that going on while the other. Right. If you think about it, it all started off with a feeling of being unhappy. I was unsatisfied with how my life was going. And so I'm trying to think, well, what will make me feel happy? What will make me feel fulfilled or satisfied? And so the brainstorm started with, you know, becoming a Navy SEAL. And so I knew the what. I want to become a Navy SEAL. The why, not such a good one. Just fulfillment, a feeling of satisfaction, a feeling of of happiness. Thankfully, those reasons actually did mature along the way. I, I began to get a better why along the way. It all ended up working out. I started off with a bad why, honestly. Um, it was just a status symbol. Right. Uh, but the why matured in this sense. Here's one of the things is, you know, my mentor, Scott, you know, he ended up taking an opportunity, as he put it, to go overseas again. And this is all going to happen just before I'm going in. I've already signed up. I've got a date, it said, to go off to boot camp. He's hopping on the phone with me, telling me, all right, Junior, I'm about, about to go do this thing. He's referring to going off to Iraq. And he says, uh, I just want you to know something, though, that I've never told anybody I've ever trained before. He goes, I know you're going to make it through SEAL training. And to hear that from Scott, my mentor, this guy that whenever we were in conversation in the car, he would tell me all the time, yeah, you never know who's going to make it. The guy that you think will make it doesn't make it. The guy you don't think will make it, that guy makes it. And I was just always waiting for him to say, though, but I think you're going to make it or you're going to do just fine. And he wouldn't say that. And I knew I was going to die before I quit, but I wanted him to have that belief in me too. And he was always very cautious not to say that. And here he is on the phone about to go off to Iraq and he's telling me something he's never told anybody he's ever trained before. I know you're going to make it through SEAL training. So that just, that meant the world to me to hear that from him. I couldn't wait for my opportunity to to make him proud and and prove him right. And uh, so he's reminding me of the timeline of things on the phone that he's only going to be gone a short amount of time, just a couple months. That's about the same amount of time I'm going to be off to Navy boot camp, which I'm leaving just a matter of days from that point. And so he's saying, look, by the time I get back from Iraq and you're done with boot camp and you start SEAL training, he says, I'm going to be there and we're, we're going to see you make it through. And so I'm, I'm excited. Just let's get this ball going. Right. And so he's saying goodbye. You know, we say our goodbyes, get off the phone. And so I figure, well, Scott's gone. You know, I just got a, a number of days before I go off to boot camp. If I can't work out with my mentor in person, what's the next best thing? Well, the next best thing is do some of these workouts we've already done together in the past. I know the program. So I'm getting up one day and the TV's on in the background. And I remember it just catches my attention because I see something on TV. It's Scott smiling on the television. And I'm thinking, what is Scott doing on TV? He didn't let me know he's going to be on TV again. He's been on TV multiple times, right? Man vs. Beast, Combat Missions, all these other you know reality programs that were going on at that time. So I just thought, he's off in Iraq. He didn't let me know he's going to be on TV again. They're using a smiling image of him. Typical shot they use before they introduce somebody onto a program. 
And so I'm not really tuned into the commentary going on in the background. I'm just looking at this smiling picture of Scott. And then I look at the lower third of the screen. And that's when I see something that jumped out. It's peculiar. It says Scott's birth date. And then followed by a dash. And then has this date, March 31st, 2004. And before I could really think through what that meant, because it's just so unexpected, I'm trying to process that. And before I could translate what that really means in my mind, it switches from this smiling image of him to graphic video footage. You know, now I'm looking at, you know, video footage of, you know, a vehicle engulfed in flames in the background, which turned out to be the vehicle that Scott was in, along with three other Americans. And it cuts to these different scenes where, you know, now they're ripped out of the vehicles and this angry Iraqi mob have surrounded their bodies and they're, they're beating and wailing away on them uh, with sticks and rods. And just they're trying every way they can just to mutilate their bodies. And then they go dragging them with, with ropes. They wrap rope around their legs and dragging them through the streets and that they're pathetic. They get tired and they hook them up to vehicles and they went dragging the bodies through the streets of Fallujah as if it was a, celebration ultimately getting to the euphrates river bridge and, and stringing them upside down setting their bodies on fire and then looking into this camera and chanting over and over in in arabic they're saying fallujah is the graveyard of americans fallujah is the graveyard of americans and so i'm just seeing all of this in in total shock and i still to this day don't know how to describe just every type of emotion and thought and feeling on the spectrum like just flooding me. And I think needless to say, this is just one of those moments in life that definitely radically changes you as a human being. Like you don't go for the same person from there. Uh, and and uh, it, it really, in another sense, though, there's this, this huge feeling of revenge that I felt, this anger, that if I could jump through that TV screen right now, as an untrained person, I would just throw myself at these people trying to rip their their hearts and their throats out. And so Scott became really a huge motivation for me in that sense. So you've got this trajectory of you're going to be a SEAL, you're going to be the man, you're, it's going to bring you all the, you know, the, uh, the acclamations that you're yeah. looking for and so forth. And that's not unusual. A lot of people do that in different ways in their lives. And yet you've got this other parallel, this kind of burning hatred that's churning you up inside. Mm -hmm. And so your motivation there for a while very worldly, mm -hmm. and you're going after it. Yeah, revenge is a fuel for sure. It's not a healthy fuel to be burning on, but that definitely is a, a fuel that could drive. I had Scott's name written on the inside of my hat going through training as a constant reminder and a constant motivation to make it through. Not just revenge, but there was some good to it. I want to do this in honor and memory of him. You know, I really had to question whether or not I was going to go ahead and go through with this after watching what happened to Scott because Correct. I had my family begging me. And understandably, now that I'm a parent looking back, you know, I can see how Scott was one of, he's a Navy SEAL, you know, and Navy SEALs, they're untouchables. And it became a reality. It's like, you know, no, like, look at this guy that we as a family, the family got to know Scott, you know, we thought he was invincible, you know, even he's not untouchable. And now you want to go in and you want to go and, and like, what would Scott say they would tell me if he could come back and talk to you? You know, what would he say to you? And their thought was he would say, don't do this. Look what happened to me or something like that. So my parents being terrified that the same thing would happen to me after watching all the same things, my dad would, you know, pull me into the room and, and try and talk with me and, and he would replay the tape. He'd have me watch it thinking it would scare me straight, scare some sense into me. But the more I watched it, the more I just became very steeled in that, that resolve that I'm going to do this. And when I was questioning whether or not to press forward, what I heard is Scott's voice saying, Junior, I know you're going to make it through SEAL training. And so that was a huge motivation. And this kind of unfurls a, another truth out of the SEAL Creed. Uh, our SEAL Creed starts off with this idea of being forged by adversity. And so adversity is something that we're all familiar with because you don't make it this far in life without getting hit with some adversity. And that's one of the things is that, you know, adversity, a lot of times you have no control over it. It just invades your life uh, like right. a like a tsunami or a, a hurricane. You have no control over the fact of, you know, this storm that comes. You can't custom choose it. And the reality that we have to face is I, I know that although I have gone through it, I'm not immune to facing more. 
it's imminent. It's not a matter of if. It's a matter of when we get that phone call. There will be some bad news. Something's going to happen to the family. Something's going to go wrong. And so it's imminent. And so I have to come to grips with the fact that, you know, I'm going to face more adversity. I have no control over that. I can't stop it. But what's the one thing I do have control over? The one thing I truly do have control over constantly is the way that I will respond to that adversity. And so I am the determiner of whether or not that adversity that, that hits will be something that causes me to fail or I'll be forged by it. Or another way to put it, like, will you allow that adversity to be what we could call, you know, a wing or a weight? Will it be a weight that just sinks you, leaves you knocked down? And, and people say, wow, look at him. He got hit. He's out for the count. Never, never coming back up from that one. No resurfacing from there. Or do you find a wing in there somehow? And the wing really is just a way to, to rise to the occasion. Yeah. And so, you know, I, I can't say that there's one way to do it because it's very circumstantial. It's based off of like whatever you get hit with. But in that particular situation, you know, with Scott, I guess you could say the way that I was forged by that adversity was reflecting back when we lose somebody. One of the things that we do is we go back, especially if it was unexpected, to the last conversation that we had with them, you know, or the last time we were with them because little did we know that was it. And so I was going over that last conversation in my head. It became so much more important. Like, what did we talk about? Like, what was said? And that's when I remember those words, Junior, you know, I know you're going to make it through SEAL training. That began the forging process right there to make it through training. But as you're going through training, you're also, there are also some of the things that are happening in your personal life. And I do want you to talk, I want to talk about that because there's, there, there's a, there's a, and what I'm leading to is that there's a point in your life where you make a decision. You know what? The most important decision I can make beyond these that you're talking about is to take, is to become a Christian. Right. Is for Jesus Christ to become the focus, the focal point, and the center of my life. But you weren't there early on in your no. journey. Yeah, it, it, it took, I guess you could say, a little bit more going down into a valley and into some of the the shadows of of darkness. So. Finally, that day comes. I make it through SEAL training. Surprise. I have 173 guys, uh, 13 of that original class number still standing there on that graduation day. And just going back to that parking lot in the junior college thinking, oh, if I could just become a SEAL, I'd be set. I'd be yeah. set for life. I could just, and then doing it for so much more in honor, memory of my mentor. I remember exactly where I was at as I was walking out onto this section that we call the grinder where we normally get beat down. Now we're graduating on that spot. And I remember looking up and thinking in my head, like, Scott, we did this. Mm -hmm. Got my family, my friends there. As this big moment's coming, I'm getting this thing called the Trident, which is our insignia that basically says, you've done it. You've become a Navy SEAL. I'm having that identity now pinned into my chest. And not only was this one of the happiest, most fulfilling moments of my life, where I really believed everything is going to be on the up and up from this point forward. The crazy thing was, is that it didn't take more than 24 hours from it, from going from one of the, the highest highs to feeling like I began to go through some of the lowest lows. I really felt like now everything is going downhill. My life is circling a drain. And, and I just couldn't comprehend why. Why is the wind suddenly getting taken out of the seals? I just achieved this thing that I thought was the ultimate. And it was years later, I heard these words spoken by the late Christian philosopher, Robbie Zacharias. And I thought those words hit the nail on the head. That's exactly what I experienced graduation day. And so this is what he says. He says, one of the loneliest moments a man will ever experience is when he's achieved that which he thought would deliver the ultimate. And in the end, it lets him down. Yeah. One of the loneliest moments a man will ever experience when he's achieved that which he thought would deliver the ultimate. In the end, it lets him down. What he's referring to right there is something I believe most people are familiar with, at least to some degree. We've all kind of touched it a little bit. It's that whole idea of the grass being greener over there on the other side. Not quite happy, not quite satisfied, not content with where I'm at. But at the same time, I'm not panicking here. I realize that if I could just get that achievement, that goal, that status over there, then I'll be satisfied. And so what happens is we develop a hunger or a thirst for that next thing. And that hunger leads to some good stuff sometimes. It, it leads to like the, the hard work, the drive, the determination. And you get there. You know, a lot of us have had that moment where we achieve, right? The 
you get the trophy, you get the trident, or the, the plaque is you know passed out. You you get to that ne that next level, and you're you enjoy it. it. It's worth taking in. But the thing is, is the satisfaction or the enjoyment that you get out of that doesn't last probably like you thought it would when you're over here on the other side, and the end it lets them down. And we see this play out in the lives of professional athletes, the rock stars, the movie stars that have everything the world has to offer at their fingertips. And yet when we turn on the television, when we open up the, the, the newspaper or a magazine and you read about what's going on in their lives, it's like a constant drama playing out. I mean, they're destroying their own lives with drugs and alcohol. They got the dream job, you know, getting to go to parts unknown. Who wouldn't trade, you know, to be in that guy's shoes? And he's taking his own life, suicidal. And we can't, we're watching from the outside, like we can't understand why, like why? Don't you realize what you had? Don't you realize what people would trade to be in your shoes? But maybe that truly is just it. We hate to buy into the, we don't want to believe it. You know, we hear it sometimes like, you know, having all that the world has to offer isn't all that it's cracked up to be. Well, I think the wisest one that ever walked the face of this planet, he phrased it a lot better, Jesus of Nazareth. And he says, what's it profit a man if he gains the whole world, but in the end loses his soul? Correct. And so I guess you could say becoming a Navy SEAL was my version of that was my gaining the whole world. That was the world to me. The problem, and I didn't know this is the problem at the time, my soul. My soul was not right. It wasn't oriented correctly, you know, with the creator. And it, I didn't go on some spiritual quest from that point forward. Uh, I just really felt like that's it. That's all this life has to offer. If anything, you know, put me on a SEAL team and I'll go overseas and, and, you know, get a little revenge over there. But I just realized like, if that, that's all it has to offer, what a, what a letdown. And so I get put on a SEAL team and we're going through the whole, you know, process of, of getting ready to deploy. And at that stage of my life, I really felt like I just didn't have any feelings anymore. Like I was just, I was numb, very calloused. But what did make me feel was in that off time, it was play time. It was time to go out and drink. That's what stimulated me. That's what kind of, you know, made me really feel something. And I would just take it way too far. I would, you know, drink into a blackout, oblivion, and wake up the next day being informed by whoever was around me that night. Like, dude, do you, do you remember last night? Do you know what you did? And a lot of shameful things. But at the time, I'd try and laugh it off as if it was, you know, comical. Like, oh, dude, what? No way. And, and uh, really, it was just robbery, you know, just personal robbery. And everything really came to a head one night where I went back to my hometown and went out with some old friends and we went to this beer fest and we ended up stealing two kegs of beer behind this, this beer stand and throwing them into the back of the truck, taking off with them and, you know, getting into one of them and stashing the other one in uh, my, my dad's garage. And so I, I drink into a blackout that night, wake up next day next early morning in the back seat of my parents' car. And I don't even know whose car I'm in. I'm just waking up, my arms all wrapped up in this comforter blanket. And it's it's dark. It's the dark hours in the morning. I'm like, who's what, where am I? Whose car am I on? I flip on the the light on the ceiling and my mom's going, he's awake. I'm like, my mom? <laughs> like what what are you guys doing? My dad's driving. He's saying, Do you remember last night? I'm like, no. He goes, man, you came home and you know, you're know you bleeding all over the place. I needed to get, I'm unwrapping my hand. I'm saying, look at your hand. I'm unwrapping the hand and it's getting stuck now on parts of the, because dried up blood. Yeah. It was uh, 26 stitches I needed to get in, in my knuckles that, that, that morning when they're dropping me off. But they're letting me know, you came home, you're out of your mind. And, and we're just, we're done. You know, this wasn't the first time that I came to their place like that. I would, whenever I was in the hometown, I would, Use the place. My old room was still there, not occupied by anyone. I would just sleep off the night, use it as a crash plan pad. But they're saying we're, we're done. You know, we, we love you. You're our son. But if you're going to come back home and go out and do that, don't even think to come to our house. Like find some other place to do it because we're not going to harbor you. And I wish I could tell you at the time I felt bad or remorse and maybe I was still inebriated. But at the time, I just I didn't feel bad at all. I, I thought it was funny that I did something where I needed 26 stitches in my knuckles that I couldn't remember. And so they dropped me off in San Diego where the, the SEAL teams are, half the teams where my team was. And uh, I go visit the doc over there because I need to get, you know, these 
st- stitched up and he's stitching up my hand and I'm sobering up. And uh, as he's stitching me up and I'm sobering up, I start to remember there was two kegs of beer. We got into one. I don't think we touched the other one. And so this kind of shows how lack of remorse there was. I thought, I want to go do it again. And so as he's finishing me up, I couldn't wait to get back to my hometown to go get into that second keg of beer with my friends. And so I'm showing up at the door and my dad is like astonished. Like, what are you doing here? And I realized he's pretty serious about not letting me in the door. And so I'm thinking, all right, deal with this diplomatically. You know, use my words, be clever. And so I know, I know they want me to go to church. They've been trying to get me to go to church for the longest time. It was something that I just kind of after, you know, high school years where your parents can't force you to get in the car anymore, you know, on a Sunday, you know, that's your guys' thing. Don't worry. I'm not an atheist. I believe in God. You're so worried about me, right? Like I believe in God. All right. Me and Jesus, I'm team Jesus. We're cool. The reality was I didn't know really what it was to have that relationship, Uh, but I know what they wanted. And so I'll give them one. You guys want me to go to church with you? I'll go to church with you. Some middle of the week thing. And so I'm thinking this will be over by 8 30, 9 o'clock at night. I don't even start my night. My night begins at like, you know, 10 or 11. So I'll go, I'll suffer through it. I'll punch my card in. And by the time we get back, they'll be so happy I went. I'll just fall right off their radar. They'll go to bed and then I'll go slip in that garage and grab that keg and off I go with my friends. Win win situation. Absolutely. So that's not exactly what happened that night. Tell, you know, what did happen? I go on thinking I'm just. Punching my card in at church. This thing gonna be over in the next hour, an hour and a half. And as the man was speaking, a man, pastor by the name of, of Greg Laurie, uh, he starts to get my attention because he's talking about this soldier by the name of Naaman. And as I'm listening to this story of this Naaman from Second Kings chapter five, I start to think like this guy sounds pretty intriguing. In fact, he sounds like he could have been a Navy SEAL had there ever been such a thing during his time. You know, as the, the picture's being painted, Naaman is his commander. He's had all this great success in battle. He's got this entourage of men that highly respect him. He's highly regarded. In fact, Naaman's identity, right, is getting him into places. He's rubbing shoulders with the king. Even the king enjoys Naaman's company. He's described as this mighty man of valor. And then there's a but. What? Well, Naaman had leprosy. And looking back, Jesus specifically called out Naaman by name said nobody during the time of Naaman had ever been healed of leprosy. And so circle back and picture Naaman this way, if you would. So much for all that success. So much for this this outward man, the armor that he wears. That's all a facade. It's, It's all a persona. What's really going on? Like what's really going on underneath that armor and underneath that clothing there, Naaman? What's really going on is he's deteriorating. He's falling apart. He's literally a dead man walking. And I started getting sucked in because, I mean, this isn't something I'm going to admit to any of my family members or friends. They, they say, Chad, you did it. You made it. You're a seal. I would totally play into that persona. Oh, yeah. Living a dream. Rock star was the truth. The truth was I felt very similar to what's going on in this, this life of Naaman. I felt like I was deteriorating underneath it all. I felt like I was falling apart. I felt like I was a dead man walking. And so I, I'm listening now to Naam, Naaman's story. And even though there was thousands of people there, suddenly I felt like I was the only one being spoken to. No doubt about it, Naaman has tried everything he can do. He's exhausted his options to fix himself of this leprosy. I'm sure he's tried to wash it off. I'm sure he's seen all the doctors. He's got power and influence. He's got everything that's accessible, you know, there for him and and nothing's working. Nobody during the time of Naaman had ever been healed of leprosy. But he hears about this man that serves God. Uh, the God of Israel, which is enemy-occupied territories that he needs to go to. Uh, but he gets told that if you would just go see this, this prophet, he will heal you of your leprosy. And so the unsung hero in this story is actually just a little servant girl that spoke up. I mean, imagine if she didn't speak up at all, but she spoke up. And so Naaman's got to get the okay from his king because he's going to this enemy-occupied territory. So he goes to his king and says, look, you know, thus and thus so says this little girl from this land of Israel. And uh, so I want to go. And the king says, go. In fact, I'll send a letter with you. Accommodation, right? You're not traveling alone here. So he's going. He's bringing his entourage with him. 150 miles they're going in, in chariots. And they finally are getting to this place. They're arriving there. 
at the door. A little peculiar because this guy's not already outside his door, you know, waiting for him. And then a servant gets set to the door to relay a message. And the message is, well, if you want to be fixed of your leprosy, just go over to the Jordan River there, dip yourself seven times. And when you come up, you'll have brand new skin. Well, Naaman becomes furious. I mean, if you can imagine, he just came all this way with his men. They get all the way to the door, and the guy doesn't even come to the door to give him a face-to-face -face conversation. This is huge disrespect, especially during that time. It was a custom of that time that basically the, the more important of a person you are, they come out to greet you. It's almost proportional to how important you are, how far they come out to greet you. For instance, if like a king is coming to a, a, a city, where are the people? They're outside. They're not just outside their door. They're outside the city gates. There's a welcoming party, right? At the very least for Naaman, this guy should have been outside the door. Instead, complete disrespect doesn't even come to the door. So Naaman, the Bible literally says, becomes furious. He could probably just about have that guy's head right now. Before he does something like that, he turns and he just begins to storm off in a rage. He's going back home and he's venting out loud. He's saying exactly, you know, what are his thoughts? Number one, he says, I expected that guy to come out of his place. And he thought he was going to put on a big show. He thought basically the red carpet was going to be rolled out for me. He's going to come out and something spectacular is going to happen here. He says, I thought the guy was going to come out and, and wave his hand over the place and, and call on the name of the Lord, his God, and then just strike the leprosy away. Instead, he gets told, just go try and wash it off. And so he's just frustrated over that saying, you know, just, Hey, can, if, if I could just wash it off, why don't I go back to the waters where I'm from in Damascus? They're far better than all the waters of Israel. And so he's leaving in this rage. And if he continues off in that direction, he's a dead man. He's got a terminal sickness, a terminal disease. Well, thankfully, it doesn't stop there. You know, Naaman's surrounded by some men, some friends that care about him. They're looking out for him. And I'm sure they don't know exactly how this all works, but I think they figured out this much. We need to get our Naaman back in front of that God of Israel and step back and let the fireworks happen. Something supernatural will take place. And so they're running up to him and they're pleading with them and they're not saying anything real brilliant here. You know, they're just using the words that they, they have and, and God can use any man's words. He could speak through a donkey. He could speak through rocks if he wanted to. We just need to be faithful and do what he wants us to do. And so they're pleading with them saying, look, Naaman, you know, if this guy came out, gave you some big, great thing to do, you would have done it. So how much more than just a simple little wash and be clean? And I mean, that's that's true. If the guy did come out, put on a big show, roll out the red carpet, stroke his ego, and then give him some big task, some big rite of passage, you know, before you're fixed of your leprosy, have we got, you know, quite the task for you. Kick off your shoes. There's broken glass. You're going to go a number of miles over. And then this obstacle course, like Naaman would probably be like, hey, show me where to start. Show me where to begin. I'll do it. But because it was such a simple little thing, just go wash and be clean, what did it seem like to him? It seemed like foolishness, totally foolishness. And what's interesting about that is that's exactly what the New Testament says about the preaching of the cross. It says the preaching of the cross is foolishness to those that are perishing. Well, no doubt about it, Naaman here is in a state of perishing. But something these guys say, it gets through. God uses it. And he is about to turn around. And when he's turning around, there's a whole lot more going on than just a mere physical change of direction. I think there's a change of direction going on in the deepest places in the heart, you know, spiritually, uh, intellectually. I think he's getting it now that it's not this water that's going to fix me. It's that if I go and do this thing, what the God of Israel wants me to do, if I'm faithful, he will be faithful and he will do the hard part. It's not the water. It's the God of Israel. He will do the heavy lifting. And so he makes this change of direction. He's walking out, no doubt, removing the armor that he would have on. He doesn't want to sink like a rock. But I think that stripping away of the armor really was the stripping away of what needed to go all that time. What was Naaman's real problem here? It was deeper than that leprosy. The real problem was the pride. And so he's stripping away that pride. He's showing humility. I think he's really getting it now. In order for me to live, I got to die. I got to die to self. I need to go to my own funeral right now. And so he makes that walk. He dips five, six, seven times. When he comes up that seventh time, 
In the literal language, the Hebrew, it says he had brand new skin like that of a baby. <laughs> and so picture that. Leprosy, first of all, what a mess. I mean, body parts fall off from it, being spotted and blotted, just all the blemishes. He struck through with a mess, but he comes up after that seventh time in brand new skin like that of a, a baby. Well, I remember being there that night and I had plans to be somewhere else. And now I'm captivated. I'm on the edge of my seat. I'm watching a movie here play out. And I loved going to the movies, especially during that time, because I didn't really like how my life was. And so the movies were a great escape. You know, it was a little bit of just, you know, getting away from all the clutter and debris of life and the lights go out. And for a little while, you get to live vicariously through some characters. It was a nice little break. And just like most movies out there, you know, the hero is going through some adversity in the beginning, like a Batman, right? Naaman's got this adversity. and But by the end of it all, it all works out for the hero in the end. So what normally happens here at this point in the movie? Well, it's over. The credits roll, the lights come back on, and now it's time to go back outside. No more escape. No more living vicariously. Now it's time to go face reality. Go return, right? Right. Well, I want to make a point that the credits don't roll right here. You know, that just as, as God provided this way out for Naaman, it gets pointed out he's provided a way out for all of us. Well, in what form? How does this all work? Dip myself into some Jordan River? Nope. What God did was he dipped his son, and that would be Jesus, down into the world. You can call it a rescue mission, a hostage rescue mission. This is Jesus, and he lives this holy, perfect, sinless life. And so it starts getting pointed out to me that this leprosy that Naaman had is a picture of something that we all have. In order for us to, to be fixed, in order for us to experience the solution, first we have to understand what is the sickness that we have. Well, Naaman had this skin disease. It was terminal. It was leprosy, and it leads to death. What's our disease? I guess you could say our disease is that we all are, by default, SIN positive. It's sin. And the Bible is very clear. The wages of sin is death. That's not just a mere physical death. Uh, this is what the Bible refers to as the second death. It's very clear. It's appointed once for a man to die, then comes the judgment. So there's something after death. The second death is hell. I don't want to you know, mince words here, sugarcoat it. It's the lake of fire. It's something Jesus taught on more than any other topic if you read through the Gospels. And why is he always talking about hell, talking about how it'd be better for you to cut off your right hand you know, to, to stop you from sinning than, or, or pluck out your eye to keep you from sinning than for your whole body to be cast into hell? He shares these things because he doesn't want anyone to go there. You know, it's, it's not a cheap trick. It's not a scare tactic. It's the same thing as, you know, if we had a loved one, a family member that, you know, was an addict of, of some sort, you know, letting them know the consequences of how this all works out, you know, with, with meth or, you know, alcohol, letting them know like you're going to destroy yourself or destroy the lives of others around you. That's love right there. It's not a cheap trick. It's not a scare tactic. It's just, this is the natural consequences, the outworkings of that life. Well, this is the outworkings of, of sin. And there's nothing we could do to get it off ourselves. Just like Naaman couldn't fix himself of his own leprosy, whatever quest he went on, he, he can't do it. We can't get sin off of ourselves. So what's our solution? Well, remember this Jesus, he was without sin. And so even though spiritually speaking, we are the leper, we are spotted and blotted and blemished, Jesus was holy and pure without sin. And most people know how the story goes. Next, he goes to the cross. But why did he go to the cross? I ask people in the street all the time, what, what is your take? Why do you think Jesus went to the cross? Most popular answer is the wrong answer. They say, oh, you know, he, he went there to like, you know, to be a sacrifice, to be a martyr, to be an example for his people. That's not why he went there with explicit purpose. It's in the name, Jesus. It says in Matthew chapter one, that he will save his people from their sins. And so here's a picture that really brought it all together for me. is that Jesus at the cross, what took place was when he went up there to the cross, he traded skin with you and I. He took our leprosy upon himself so that we could be switched and lavish with that, that perfect life, that grace and mercy that God offers. Not only does he pay for the penalty of our sin in full at the cross, but this is a significant part that gets left out sometimes. He rises again from the dead. And what does that show? It shows that not even the grave can hold this guy down. 
And then he declares from that resurrected life, he says, because I live, because I have a resurrected life that overcomes the grave, you also shall live. That's what he offers to all of us. But what's the turning point? How do we receive that gift the same way that Naaman received the gift of, you know, being cleansed of his leprosy? Very similar. Naaman had to do a 180. He had to go to his own funeral, as it were. He needed to deny self. Interestingly, Jesus says, if anyone wants to come after me, they must, starts with this, deny self. We have to have that name and moment where we just come to grips and, and come to reality and face that I can't do this you know, on my own. And I need to throw myself at the, the, the other mercy of the creator of the universe to help me here, which is a hard thing to do for anyone especially for a guy that says, I'm going to die before I quit, right? Like I'm always wanting to do everything on my own, you know, my way. But the solution here is to surrender. I'm not the kind of guy that like, likes to raise a white flag, right? But I realize that it, it is, you know, surrender, you know, to the, the almighty. And so what we're called to do, deny self, that's what the Bible refers to as repent. Another Christian term that doesn't get thrown around the street too often. So what is repentance? Simply put, it's not just being sorry I got caught. It's I'm so sorry, God, I want to change. I'm so sorry. I want to disassociate with this old person that I am. Very similar to how like Jesus, when he went to the cross and was crucified, he was nailed up there. Nail the old me up there. And just as he was buried, bury the old me. And just as Jesus rose again, new from the grave, that's what I'm asking for. Please give me that new life. And just like that leprosy that was blotted out, the New Testament says, repent and be changed that your sins may be blotted out, that times refreshing may come. And so what we're doing is we're repenting. I'm so sorry, I want to change. And then we're throwing ourselves upon the mercy of the Savior, which is Jesus. And it's all in the name. Why do we call him the Savior? Because he saves us from our sin. And the moment that any man or woman does that, they don't have another man's word on it. They have God's word on it. He says, he'll remember their sin no more. Remove it as far away as the east is from the west. So, so that night, you're listening to this story. You're on the edge of your seat. And you feel like he's speaking directly to you and to nobody else in the audience. And something happens. Tell me, tell me what's going on inside yourself. I find myself responding to that message. Something, there was so much going on inside my head. Uh, number one was just this, just screams of, this is truth. I knew this is truth right here. The other thing was, I've been Why present. did that truth resonate that particular night? Maybe it, maybe it took me exploring a lot of the other options out there in life. You know, maybe just realizing that, that everything else has nothing else to really offer. You'll always be hungry and thirsty for more, never really satisfied. Uh, but that's because all these other things are not the true meaning of life. You know, I came to that realization, just like Jesus says, what's it profit a man if he gains the whole world, but in the end loses his soul? What I was missing all along was having my soul oriented correctly with my creator. Once I really understood, I'm not here on earth to try and live a happy life. I'm not here on earth to see my dreams, my goals. And that's, you know, come but to that's life. not an answer that a lot of people are seeking because they think they're here on earth to be, live a happy life. Right. And that's why we don't like to hear that all that the world has to offer is not all that's cracked up to be. Right. But once I realized the true purpose of being here is to know my creator, the one that made me, you know, that's what really resonated as this is truth. And what was the obstacle that was keeping me from that all that time? Well, the scripture talks about it. it, says our sins have separated us from our creator. Right. But Jesus came to bridge that So that elaborate gap. on that, sins. People hear that word thrown around. Sometimes it's a, it's a, a little bit sure. of a, a, a Christian churchy word. Sins, for some people, sounds like, wait a minute, that's what I call fun. The Bible admits that. It says in the book of Hebrews that sin is fun for a season, uh, but it does reap consequences. And so there's a reason why these things are, are sins or, or violations of God's law because ultimately they're harmful to us if uh, we don't practice things the right way. And then the other reality of that is that we all fall short. Mm -hmm. We all fall short of the glory of God. So it's not your works. It's not your achievements. It's not those things. Now, your, your journey and mine, if you want to use the word journey, our lives, our experiences are similar um, in that 
we both are achievers. They, you, you set your mark on, on uh, being a Navy SEAL. I had set my mark on certain things. Some of it was what I wanted to do. Some of it was trying to make my family happy. I said that, you know, being the person they thought I ought to be. Um, and that's all part of each person's story and so forth. But the one similarity that we possess is that we achieve those things and then realize that they were, they were empty. Uh, there are also people who experience the exact opposite. They get to the point where they're so low that they realize there's only one way out and that's up. And then they, they say, Lord, I've made such a mess of my life. And it seems, it seems, maybe I'm wrong, but it seems the person that finally hits rock bottom hasn't anything to lose. The person who's the achiever is still kind of drawn into, hey, the, I've got my happiness and my success and my achievements, and I can still hang my hat on the merit of that. I think it's a little bit more difficult to play that one off, though, in front of others, because like you said, on the outside, we can hang our hat on those things. But the truth is, we really know who we are underneath it all. The person that has hit rock bottom, especially in front of everybody, it's kind of like, well, you know, it's very transparent. They're out there. It, it is perhaps maybe a little bit easier because it is just all up from here, right? There's humility in that. But the danger for someone that has achieved something is the danger of the pride in the ego and that refusal to let others know really who they are or what they are. It's all an illusion and we don't want them to know that about us. And so the real question is, who are you? When you're in your room, the lights are off and all you're left with is your own thoughts. You know who that person is. God knows who that person is. And maybe you're fool fooling other people out there. And that's, that's the tough thing to really strip away. That was very, that was one of the most difficult things for me that night, March 14, 2007, when I heard that message, was to get up out of my seat because it was an altar call to go forward. And I'm sure everyone around me was probably happy for me celebrating, right? But for me, that was a sense of like, that was just total humility, you know? And I didn't want people looking at me, you know, in that, that moment. Um, but it also felt like the weight of the world off my shoulders when I was making that sort of name and walk, right. you know, doing that 180 and just kind of saying, yeah, this guy that a lot of you know to be a Navy SEAL, I don't have it all together. Yeah, I'm, I'm giving it all up right. in a sense, right. and I'm throwing myself upon you. And there's more in the book that talks about that, I'm, and I, I want to jump a little bit over that. So again, I'm going to encourage people, buy the book and, and, and hear the rest of that story, because you've got a relationship with your, at that point, girlfriend, Aubrey, who is confused by what you're doing, and yet you've got your parents on the other side who are thrilled with what you've done, and now you've got to go back to uh, back to the seals and how are they going to respond to it? And anyway, all those things in the book, all very, very, uh, very, very cool things. And I think you ought to, somebody ought to buy the book, or again, one for a friend. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and then and then uh, and and dig into that a little bit more. One of the joys for me is that I happen to be one of those people that uh, heard you speak in a group. And then I reached out to you another time, and you came and spoke to a group, a gathering that we actually had. Um, under a tent, bonfire, group of guys, barbecue, just hanging out in the field, and you you spoke to that group, and then and 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 we've continued to uh, keep in touch with one another. we you know follow each other's uh, what's happening in our own lives and our ministries and 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 so forth. And so I want to ask, you know, all right, what's next? What's next for you? Uh, what's going on in your ministry? How are people who are listening? How can they actually uh, reach out to you or actually have you to be um, involved in some things that they might be interested in engaging in? So about three years ago or so now, I, I just jumped into like the full-time you know, speaking ministry. So for a while there, I was working in ministry, either at a parachurch ministry, Living Waters with Ray Comfort, who I, I've learned so much from. He's been a great mentor, the, the same the church that I go to, Harvest, uh, doing the high school ministry. Uh, but I really felt the tug towards, you know, going out and, and speaking sort of like in a full-time um, gospel presentation, faith-based outreach is kind of like we had, had done together, just getting the gospel out to as many people as, as possible. So I want to have the greatest impact I, I possibly can. 
And so uh, that's what I have been doing. It's been interesting. The season that we're in uh, with a lot of public speaking engagements, you know, being canceled because large groups of people can't come together, kind of patiently, you know, waiting that one out and hoping that right. it could restart again. Right. Uh, but yeah, my desire is just to keep doing what I'm doing in that sense and, and just to, you know, a, a greater capacity and whatever that looks like, you know, it's just, it's all about having a, a loyal heart towards the Lord and he's going to do his thing. And so I just think of 2 Chronicles 16, 9, the eyes of the Lord go to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose hearts are loyal to him. And so what he's really been showing me is it's not necessarily about, you know, big crowds, big crowds haven't been around, you know, since March, early March. Um, but it's really uh, living in the moment, being really intentional, just with the people that you're with, the relationships that you make. At the end of the day, those are the things that that really last. It's not about numbers in the end. Um, it's about the names, you know, of the people that you're you're with. There was something that we would write on the inside of our hats before we would go into Hell Week. I alluded to one of them. It was, you know, Scott Helvenston. Um, and as I think about it in ministry, I've been in that place where, you know, I'm doing a hospital visit or a home visit where somebody's, you know, nearing the end of their life and they want to talk to, you know, a, a minister of some sort. And they'll they'll bring up things in life. They they, they got to get stuff off their chest. And they'll bring up the things that they regret sometimes. And the things that they regret are it's not so much the things that they did do. It's the things that they didn't do. And the commonality that I would see in all of that is it, it always seemed to have to do something with faith, family, and friends. Yeah. That they wish they would have worked on their relationship, you know, with their creator that they're about to go meet shortly. Uh, they wish they would have done more for him. Uh, they wish they would have spent more time with their family and not so much time, you know, on work. Yeah. And, and the same goes, you know, with, with friends. And so those are the things written on the inside of guys' hats that made it. If yeah. I think about it, it was yeah. faith, family, and friends. I had family on the inside of my hat. I had my friend on the inside of my hat. And even though I did, wasn't really walking with the Lord at that time, like I said, I wasn't an atheist. I knew, well, if I'm going to make it through this thing, definitely want God on my side. Right. So I had, right. you know, a scripture on the inside of my hat. And so uh, I've just been being reminded of that, I think a lot more lately that those are the most important things in life worth investing into. And there's a whole lot of other things that I won't be regretting at the end of my life if I'm not spending too much time invested in them. So as we wrap this up, is there something you might want to say to somebody that is at that moment, at that moment of, hey, you know, I'm not sure if I'm going to, if if this is this life is worth living or if I want to take my life. Uh, or there's somebody who's saying, you know what, I've achieved all these things and I've got a great deal of pride that's kind of masking my unhappiness. Wh what would you say to those folks? Right. Uh, number one, I would turn back to that, that passage for the person that thinks that, you know, they've achieved all these things, but you know, they're, they're being masked is truly what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul for the person that, you know, might really be sick of their own lives and they hate themselves and they have that horrible self-talk and maybe they even want to take their own lives. You know, that's certainly not coming from God. That's the enemy of our soul. You know, Satan is real. God is real. Satan is real as well. And he is the ultimate terrorist. He is the ultimate suicide bomber. I mean, when you think about it, Navy SEALs have been tasked with going after men that have bad intentions, maybe strapping on a suicide vest and, and their goal, they know they're going down. Obviously they're taking themselves out. Right. But they're not content with just that. What do they want? They want to take out as many people with them as they possibly can in the process. Well, in a very similar way, the enemy of our soul, Satan, is that guy that is strapped. I say he's the ultimate suicide bomber because he knows he's going down, but he's not content with just that. What is his goal? Take out as many people with him as he possibly can in the process. And he's very crafty about the ways that he goes about it. For some people, he gets them totally sucked up and making things in their life God that aren't really God's, you know, idols. For other people, he's that accuser. You know, he is that that voice in, in their ear, you know, saying that you're not worthy. You shouldn't live your life. You should take yourself out. And so he wants to take out as many people with him as he possibly can. But again, as, as Christians, we're called to foil his plans. Just like Navy SEALs, we foil the plans, you know, of a suicide bomber. We're to foil his plans. How? By spreading the truth, the gospel message, that this life is not all that there is, that there is an afterlife, 
we can talk of words like words like like hope. What is our hope? Our hope is all about the next life. This life is not the best life. That would make for a very strange Garden of Eden, you know. But this is the proving ground. You know, choose this day whom you will serve. So every person comes to that point, I think, in, in life where they have to make a decision. You know, it comes down to love, as C.S. Lewis puts it. Like, does your love for this world completely outweigh your love for the Creator that made you and made the world? If you choose that over Him, He's not going to force you. We call it a relationship because it is a relationship that you have with the Creator. He's not going to force you to choose Him and, and come to heaven. If you want nothing to do with Him, to be in heaven would be hell. So He'll allow that. He's given you free will. Or do you finally come to a point where you hear what Jesus has done? And you're moved by it. And you say, my love for him outweighs my love for all of these other things and this sin. And, I, and I'm ready to commit my life to him. If you don't want to live your life anymore, yeah, kill yourself, that old self, and get the new life that he offers. He'll give you purpose. If you don't know what your mission is, he'll give you the mission. And one way to maybe understand it uh, would be like this. You know, I kind of alluded to that ambush that my team was in. And that final operation. And obviously came home alive. I'll tell you all the guys came home alive from that one. We overcame the enemy. We, we fired and drew back on them and we flanked them and killed some and captured the one that we're going after, you know, wounded and alive. I was one of the guys that was given the responsibility of carrying this guy in our own hospital, which was really bizarre for me, but it was also a full circle moment for me. Because if you remember pre-Christian days, how I felt, about anyone in that that region. And now I'm a Christian and we're preserving life wherever possible. That's just what we do in the SEAL teams. But I, I, I almost fantasized at this moment in my mind what I would do face to face with someone like this. And now here I am given the responsibility to, to save his life, the guy that was just trying to kill us. And uh, for me, that was kind of a, a full, full circle moment right there, uh, <clears throat> bringing him into our hospital. But what I want to get around to is that although we all came home alive, it, it doesn't always work out that way. And so a name worth highlighting would be Michael Mansour, who, while he was in Ramadi, Iraq, on top of a roof, providing cover for some other SEALs that were on the road, an insurgent ran up and threw a hand grenade on that roof from some unknown location. It hits Mikey right in the chest, falls through the dark. And if you can imagine, he had an exit, like just a step away. He could get away from that grenade, save his life. But the rub was is that there's other seals on the roof with them and they didn't have time to make it past that grenade and to some exit. And so in a split second selfless act, he hollers out to them grenade so they could take cover as he throws himself over the top covering it and it went off. And he absorbed the blast of that grenade, took all that shrapnel, the metal, his body just took it and he suffered and died. But because of what he did, all these other men on the roof, they all lived. And so you could certainly mark these words down in history. Greater love has no one than this and the one that lays on his life for his friends. That's what Mikey did. You know, even my friend Scott, you know, looking back, you know, one of the last things he ever said to me is, Junior, when I go over there, perhaps I can make a difference. And so although, you know, he was killed and all these awful things dragged through these streets, hung upside down from that Euphrates River Bridge, it wasn't in Maine. You know, he was over there for a reason, for a purpose, for the sake of freedom. So again, you know, you think of those words, greater love has known than this, the one that lays on his life for his friends. He manifests that. And then finally, one more that's worth speaking about would be the one who spoke those words of greater love. And that's none other than Jesus. Those are his words. And he said those words at a very unique time. It's prior to going to the cross. And Mikey took that shrapnel. Jesus absorbed sin upon himself. Why? So that we could pass by that grenade, as it were, so that we could live on in eternity with him. That grenade wasn't Mikey's problem. He could have saved himself, but he covered it for the sake of others. And sin was never Jesus' problem. He could have saved himself, but he covered it, you know, for us. And my friend Scott, you know, killed and hung from that Euphrates River Bridge, ultimately for freedom's sake, I say, when we looked at the cross, wasn't Jesus killed and hung from the cross of Calvary, ultimately for freedom's sake, so that we could be set free from the eternal consequences of our own sin. So greater love is no one than this and the one that lays on his life for his friends. We can see it in men like Mike Monsoor, Scott Halbenstein, so many others that have gone before us, but the greatest of all looked at the cross. 
that's the proper perspective of that, that King of Kings, that Lord of Lords, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And it says of him, for he, speaking of the Father, made him Jesus who knew no sin to become sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And the critical word there is might, because it's not a default position. At the end of the day, everybody that's listening or watching right now, it comes down to responding. You have to respond. And so I think it's kind of like doing the Naaman thing. Maybe you're watching this right now and realizing, wow, like that's me. I'm totally living that, that name in life. I am this certain man on the outside when in reality, in front of my coworkers, my family members, my friends, I'm another person underneath it all. Remember, like, who are you? Who are you when you're in that room all by yourself? The lights are off and all you're left with is your own thoughts. You know who that person is. God knows who that person is. And he doesn't want to rub your nose in it. That's the thing. He doesn't want to make you feel, you know, more shame about it. What he wants to do is set you free. But what you need to do is the Naaman thing, which is to humble yourself, to repent of your sin. So sorry, you want to change and ask Jesus to be your savior, to save you from what? To save you from your sin. And remember the moment that any man or woman does that, it's not another man's word on it, it's God's word on it. To remember your sin no more. Cast it into the depths of the ocean, removed as far away as the east is from the west. And so anyone can do that. And one of the things about that night when I got saved was, I had heard this message before, but it didn't resonate with me. And it was resonating with me. And something told me this door that has opened to me before. It's been available all this time. It has opened and closed and opened and closed. Something told me. And I can't confirm this, right, scientifically, but I knew this is kind of like a last call, that God's opening up an opportunity for me right now. If I reject it again, this door just might close for the last time and he might not open up to me anymore. I knew I needed to respond in that moment. And so, hey, we're not promised tomorrow. Life is a vapor. You know, we're here for a little bit, little window of opportunity. Any one of us could be taken at any moment. And so if you realize that what I'm saying, sharing with you, this message of the gospel is truth, it's truth worth responding to. And it's not me opening up an opportunity to you and you don't open up the opportunity whenever you want to. Uh, this is an opportunity that, that God opens up to you. So if it's God that's speaking to your heart, to your conscience, if you're you know, comprehending that this is truth, I, I would highly suggest you respond to it now. And uh, you won't regret it, regret it, just like you said. You know, whenever you make a decision you know, to, to follow the Lord, to do what God would have you do, you might go into it dragging your feet, but you'll come away clicking your heels, never regretting you know, what you've just done. Well, Chad, I want to thank you for your time. I want to thank you for your encouragement and the work that you're doing. Uh, it's great to see the way the Lord's blessing your life, your wife, your children, your son and daughter, and your parents. I appreciate your time today. Mm -hmm.